There we go. You're looking fantastic. How are hey, you? Hey, thanks. Um, I'm half the man I used to be. <laughs> Is that <laughs> in what way? Tell me. Well, uh, I got pictures of me at like when I started this journey um, with fascial maneuvers. I I was a bodybuilder when I started <clears throat> on this uh, this whole health journey. I <clears throat> I started in the uh, in the 80s and I went national to become a pro bodybuilder and I decided that wasn't the light for me a lot of things contributed including some injuries and what happened for me is I um, I I um, had been maintaining my body my whole life through diet exercise you know if I got a little too heavy I worked out a little harder I leaned up every once in a while and went up and down but I was normally like 250 and about 235 most of my life. And I'm about five foot ten then. And um, <clears throat> so fast forward as I started doing the fascia work and then gave up trying to manage my weight and my food and stuff like that, just had a consistency and then started taking care of the fascia in my body. I ballooned up to about 250 pounds. And then I went on a, a as a part of it, not because of the weight, I went on a 44 day fast with Jason and Cynthia. And at the end of it, I was still fat, like legitimately fat. I have, I have pictures. I, I'm going to be posting a new set right away. And I'm like, how can I not eat for six weeks and like be fat? And this drew this whole new belief system about the body. And that's what came fashion maneuver. So my journey through that is I don't exercise. I don't work out. It looks like I, it looks like I work out. I mean, but it's different tissue. It's fascial tissue. It's very soft and spongy. I, I have complete mobility, dexterity. I can dislocate all my joints. And I went from this heaving 250 pound guy down to my 14 year old body weight, which is about 175 pounds, or I guess about 47 kilograms or something like that. And, and that's the weight I'm at, which is I haven't been this, this light since I was 16 years old or 14 years old, somewhere between 14 and 16. I love it. It's um, I, I want to get into fascia and and understand that. So um, not only me but uh, the viewers and listeners can can understand what fascia is if they if they're not aware of it. But first off, human garage. First, I, I just want to say what a beautiful uh, brand name, and I want to understand how you came up with it and if it was you that came up with it. The human garage or garage. Tell me about yeah. it. And why why you chose garage as the uh, as the terminology to use for the brand and the and the process that you've created. <clears throat> well, I'd like to say because it's because we started in a garage. We did, but we didn't even realize that we named it human garage and we started in a garage because the time we named it, we were out of the garage. So it didn't even dawn on us. It's a nice story to say because we started in a garage. Um, and we did start in a garage. But um, I, my, uh, a guy that I had worked with with all my businesses, he, his name's Dan Alessic. He wow, a branding company out of Vancouver, Canada. He's done my companies, my businesses for over 30 years, or 25 years, sorry. He, um, <clears throat> we, I, I went up and I had this new way of working with the body. And I said, you got to help me brand this. I don't even know what to call it. It's not chiropractic. It's not fascial work. It's not massage work. It's this new way. And so he sat there and watched me work up with people for about, uh, about three days. And he says, you look like you're a mechanic. Like you're getting them to walk. You're coming back. You're adjusting something. You're having them walk again. And, and, he says, and I said, yeah, I guess it am. I'm kind of like tinkering and moving stuff around. And uh, he says, well, a mechanic would work in a garage. And we said, well, initially body garage. And we said, well, marketing wise, that would be confusingly similar to the body garage where you get your car fixed. So we had to, you can't human body garage. That was too much. So we shortened it to human garage. And the idea behind it is almost all good ideas start in a garage. And a garage is where you keep your second most valuable asset. A garage is where you tinker around with things. You create ideas, you sit around. There's a lot of stuff that creation energy that happens in the garage. So that's the reason why we named it because I was working like a me mechanic on our vehicles 
human vehicles and they were in a garage. But ironically, this whole thing did start in a garage. We started in Venice, California. Um, we were uh, had a clinic and we were doing this fascial work that didn't belong to the clinic. Like it was just clearly not the clinic's work. So I took one of my uh, physical therapists and we would practice in my garage at night. And we live in this big complex. <clears throat> People would walk around, you know, to and from this gym that was around the corner from us all day. And then they would stop and ask questions. So we would try to tell them the story of, uh, of what we were trying to do. Like it was new, it was a concept. So we would, we would pitch them. And <clears throat> this one guy finally said, you got to fix me. I, I've got this surgery in my back. And he had three months of him asking us every day. And finally said, okay, look, at, we'll do four sessions. We have this new protocol called a posture correction protocol. It's created by my partner back then, Joseph Gonzalez. And <clears throat> we, we did it on him. He, for the first time after surgery, had pain relief. And he happened to be a hairstylist for all the celebrities. We're talking, ran, uh, we're talking um, Katie Lotz from you know DC Comics, which led to Brandon Roth. To all the celebrities started coming to this garage in Venice to get treatment, and that's how the human garage started. Such a great story. When you say you've created this new way of working with the body. I'm fascinated about the the download or the how you came up with it. Is it an amalgamation of different techniques? I mean, I've interviewed people before that have been on psychedelic journeys or different types of breathwork journeys where they get these downloads and remembrances or understandings into deeper knowledge and de deeper gnosis or wisdom of how the universe works and how our bodies work sure. and our minds work and our consciousness works. How did it flow into you or through flow through you? And was it a team collaboration or was it something that uh, just was an epiphany for you? Well, <clears throat> there's a couple of different things. Um, the, <clears throat> sorry. The, the very first thing and the most important thing about it was that um, there was uh, self-discovery. I had been on a pain journey trying to fix my body for 25 years at that point. I had spent millions of dollars, literally millions of dollars, trying to resolve issues in my body. And from a series uh, at that time, eight concussions, and various accidents and I was a big guy bodybuilder um, thick in muscle and that's where it started so I got into clinical practice and we were taking things this posture correction therapy was as a mashup of of what you would call like you say other therapies it was kind of like rolfing it's kind of like structural integration we use chiropractic we use acupuncture we use some massage we, we use internal medicine, um, integrative medicine uh, as a result of uh, doing it, but it wasn't unique in itself. It was just a mashup of different things. And I had spent seven years in that journey working with my 52 practitioners over that time. And if I left the garage and didn't get treatment on a weekly basis, I was in pain again. So I hadn't really solved the issue. So at during this time, I had been constantly discovering new things about the body that we just couldn't have we had no basis in science for it like there was no way to explain <clears throat> why the body was responding the way it did to the therapy or to the treatment or to the touch that we were giving so it led to this personal discovery um first of all i have to tell you that um, fascial maneuvers is not a therapy it's a philosophy of movement and, and it starts off with a, with a philosophy, a rethinking of how the human body works. Because I, I think in the last 10,000 plus years that Chinese medicine has been around, we pretty much thought of everything that we could think of. Like there's nothing new. Everybody's Chinese. And allopathic medicine is not doing anything new. It's taking old ideas and looking at them in a new way. <clears throat> but we got to the top of fixing the human body in the world based on what we did. 
like when the sports teams like the Dodgers and when LA, when their top players couldn't get fixed, they came to us. So that meant that at somehow when they, when the best organizations, billion dollars organizations couldn't repair their players, they came to us, that put us somewhere in the top. And it's still, I was still dysfunctional. So I just kept looking for more answers. I wasn't accepting the fact that I was going to be like this the rest of my life. I just had this vision that I, that I could be young and, and free in my body again. So <clears throat> the personal journey was this redefining the body. We said, there's some major things about the body, Pete, that just don't make sense. Like your bones are structure. Is that a structural problem? Well, none of the bones in your body touch except for your teeth, your rib cage, and your ears. So that means that none of these bones, if they touch, you're in pain. That means they can't be structure. Structure is these walls here nailed together. So what is structure? Well, muscles don't like the knee joint. Muscles don't cross the knee joint. One, one does, but it's not holding you up. Tendons keep you from pulling apart. So what's structure? The only thing that's left is connective tissue. What is connective tissue? It's fascia. So fascia, we had to say, well, the body, we had all these things that we looked at and said, it just doesn't make sense. Like the body, the bones aren't structure. After that, everything, it's like saying the earth is flat or round. And I don't care which one you say it is. <clears throat> if it's if the bones aren't structure, then what are they? Why do they exist? Then what is the structure? And then how does that structure organize and how does it work? And then from there, it led to a series of understandings. Like we believe that fascia was intelligent. And um, sure enough, I mean, uh, and this is a back in like 2010, 2011, 2012. But by 2017, science had come out and said, well, your brain has 100 billion nerve endings. Your fascia has 100 trillion nerve endings. So these nerve endings and nerve cells are the equivalent of horsepower in your car. So your fascia has a thousand times more horsepower, times more horsepower than your brain. So, you know, bones aren't structure. The real brain is in the body. And this, so what is this? Well, this is actually, a think of it as a processor on your computer. It identifies patterns. It, it runs programs. And when you're done with the program, it puts it away. Like, I don't want to remember that. And so, and you even think about the term, like, remember. If you were to dismember somebody, you cut them up in pieces, right? To remember, we're putting back the pieces and presenting it to the brain for a narrative or for a view. So we were just questioning at this point, I said, we have to start over and we have to go to the groundwork of how we're born, who we really are, and then how we live our lives. And so Fashion Maneuvers was a personal study of those issues um, against a clinical model, a scientific model. And then a lot of discoveries along the way. And as I went more and more discoveries, as I opened up my body, I went from being very fact-based to very intuitive-based. So it was a journey from, from I have to see it to believe it to uh, I have to believe it to see it. What? <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> What do you believe pain is? Why do, why do you believe we we suffer pain in our bodies? What what is the um what is the direct result of that in mm. your experience? Because I know so, a lot of people that suffer suffer pain, and you talk about um, <clears throat> the allopathic paradigm and all the different. Facilitators are out there, chiropractic, osteopathic, Bowen treatment, massage, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, all of these things. And and one thing that I think is so fascinating is you can go and visit a chiropractor, for instance, and you can feel great relief. But then a week okay. later or two weeks later, that issue starts to present itself again. You feel pain whether it, wherever it's stored in your body. So... I want to nail it down to what do you believe pain is telling us and why these modalities offer relief, but sometimes it's just a Band-Aid solution. And yeah, I'll, I'll leave it with that to start with. Sure. <clears throat> okay, well, since we're re-looking at the body, 
we have to relook at all the primary movements or mechanisms that make the body work and function. Pain is the greatest motivator of human experience. When the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change, human beings change, but not until then. We think that inspiration to change, is it? No, it's the pain of what the inspiration is leading us away from that moves us. I don't wanna be this. I don't want to look like this. I don't want to be broke. I want to I want to live this life, but I don't want this. So pain is a communication mechanism that your body is trying to talk to you. And if we get rid of the pain, which I'm very good at, and I became very good, like arguably the, one of the best in the world. If we get rid of pain, but we don't understand why the pain was there, that pain is 100% guaranteed to come back. And even if I get rid of it in an area, it doesn't come back in that area. It's going to come back somewhere else. Pain is the body's mechanism of communication and motivation. But what, one thing that is that's relevant about pain is if you have a like a two out of 10 pain here and your body fires adrenaline, norepinephrine, and cortisol, stress hormones, two out of 10 becomes a six or a seven like that. So stress hormones make pain worse or intolerable. So <clears throat> if I fear something, fear causes stress. So if I fear pain, pain becomes intolerable. And then if I was taught that pain is bad and I should sedate it, then I'll never truly understand it because it's the body that's talking to you. Like people go, my body's broken. I'm like, you're breathing and you're talking to me, then, but by evidence, sure evidence, your body's not broken. Your body is, if, you're, if you can breathe and you can, and you can talk you're, or move or, or, or communicate, whether it's eye blinking or whatever, your body's not broken. It's still working, despite all the crazy crap that you did, that did to it. So it's re-looking at what, the, what it is. It, the body is really trying to talk to us. And the origin of pain in the body is interesting. I, I think maybe to put it in context, do you, want me, do you want me to tell you where origin of pain came from and control? Uh, yes, please. The, I don't say this too often, so this is a good one. So pain is about using pain is the greatest way to control somebody. Society. So if you go back thousands of years ago, before we understood the rhythms of the earth, or the, the, the masses understood Somebody who was learned and understood that would put everybody together in a square right, right before an eclipse and say, if you don't listen to me, then I will do this. And the eclipse comes and then it goes and you will starve and your crops will go. So people started listening to them. Now, over a couple of generations, people go, that happened to my grandfather and my grandfather. And by the way, that was the same day of the year. And it's like, so now the jig is up. So, there, so what happened is they said, okay, that control mechanism of society no longer works. So let's, we have to take pain and put it somewhere where you can't actually measure it. So what we're going to do is we're creating religion and we put pain behind death. So if you don't listen to me now, you're going to have pain when you die. And, and we're, think about the word religion is religion. That's a Roman word that means to conscript you back into the army to religion you. So they brought pain in uh, after death and they said, well, you don't listen to me. You're going to pain after you die. And then some guys after, you know, a couple hundred years said, you know something, screw it. I'm going to live my life. And so they started disobeying the church. So they needed a new mechanism of control. So they brought pain back from the grave and they brought it back to a doctor who says, if you don't listen to me, you'll be in pain today and tomorrow. And so pain is a conscription mechanism. It's a control mechanism or the fear of pain. Because pain itself, if you, if you thought that pain was good, your perception, your, your body will then send oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine as a part of the experience. And pain itself actually becomes not bad and even to sometimes pleasurable or at least informative. And you know the saying, no pain, no gain. Like if you go to the gym, and you work out or you have a rough time in your life 
and it's painful. But if you know that you have a reward at the end, you go, I'm okay with this kind of pain. I got a reward. It's okay. It's okay, honey. Don't stop it. I got the reward. The reward's over there. So if I can step back and look at my life in a different way and say it's all there to help me some way, then pain no longer is that unbearable. It's just something that I am listening to communicate with my body. And this is what you do because you use food and fasting as a way to learn to communicate with the body. Fasting is a mechanism to communicate. Well, pain, there's pain in going into a fast for people. I mean, probably not you. And probably if you told me we're, we weren't eating for two months, I'd be hallelujah, man. It's like, it's like, I prefer not to eat, but everybody else around me eats. So there's pain going into that, but you know there's a reward. And the body gets trained for reward mechanisms. That's the other side. If I know that I do this to get something and I do this to get something and that something is something I want, the body stops acknowledging the pain side of it and just goes to the reward side of it. There's a lot to a uh, lot to unpack there, but I guess it's a it's a pretty simple uh, philosophy as well, and and that's where I want to get to with with um, the work that you do. The thing that keeps coming to me lately is less is more, and the more simple that we view ourselves and the world in which we inhabit. Yeah, I, I believe the less stress that we bring into our bodies and into our consciousness and into our minds. And um, tell me about your philosophy about less is more and and Let's talk about simple, stress. simple things in life. Yeah. Let's talk and about stress. stress. Yeah. Stress isn't your job. <clears throat> stress isn't your government. Stress isn't taxes. Stress isn't the chemicals in your life. Those are stressors. Stress is my response to it. So if I'm hungover and somebody's flicking the lights or making loud noise, I'm like, I can't handle it. But if I'm not hungover, it doesn't even bother me. So stress, it, like pain, is relative to the experience. Fair statement? So <clears throat> we can limit our stress um, by, limit, by taking care of our bodies. When we take care of our bodies, we have more capacity to bring stressors in without feeling overwhelmed so that we can't handle it. So that's the first thing. Gotta to, got to remove the, the, the body's uh, vicious stress response. What was the second? Because we you asked about it was about, and this is a question I've asked. Uh, different podcasters before that have amassed a lot of information over the years. And if anybody listens to a lot of podcasts, there is so much information out there. And part of me is that is fantastic that we know so much. And there's so many different avenues in which we can go down and, and keep creating or learning knowledge into our system. But I often wonder if uh, too much information is overwhelming for for ourselves and whether you yourself over the years of learning a lot of this information have simplified your life and simplified your message so that it's easier for people to, to understand, download, and then put into practice. Yeah. Okay, yes, yeah, simplification. Yes, less is more. <clears throat> the, the more that we do to the body, the, the more the body, if I do, if I do a habit, something for you over and over again, your body becomes dependent upon it. And if your body is dependent upon it, um, if your body is dependent upon it, then it stops its normal function. Fair statement. Anytime we stop a function in the body, it's not a good thing. So the less I do for my body, the better my body's ability to cope and adapt to the environment. Like if I wear, if I use a crutch every day on one side, eventually I lose my ability to properly walk. So, so the, the key elements are how does the machine work by simplifying it? 
we are 70% water, 25% uh, silica, sand, basically, 5% bacteria and viruses and parasites. So we're basically water and sand at the top of it with a bunch of other things around it. And if we give the body the basic elements it needs and the basic minerals it needs, and we move the body, because movement is what remediates stress properly, if we properly move the body, um, then the body has the highest ability to heal itself. So it learns by healing itself. And if I take away something, like, like if I take a supplement constantly, then eventually my body stops trying to resolve that or find it. So if I take a supplement, the body is going to stop producing it or stop learning how to extract it out of the environment. Fair statement? Same thing with food. <clears throat> and this is why the more, the more natural the food, the simpler it is, uh, the more basic it is, the easier it is for our body to assimilate and process. So this is a starting point. Um, then it goes into extends into areas of your life. Like everything that I own, I can pack up in 10 minutes and be ready to leave. <clears throat> now, it took me a decade to get there because I have all these things that I have and these beliefs that I have. Like I got to have this. I got to sleep on this kind of pillow. I got to have this kind of supplement. I got to have all these things. And I have this belief about all the things that I need. And those beliefs are attachments which make me have fear or uncomfortable if I don't have them. So, I mean, it's a biblical experience. It's like, give up all your attachments, possessions. We don't possess things. We possess, we possess the feelings attached to things. So give up all your attachments and you shall find salvation. I mean, it was the simplest thing ever. But it's, it's really about... The body is meant to heal itself. And everything that we do over and above what the body gave us takes away something that the body is supposed to do or innately knows how to do. And we're born into dysfunction now, especially our children today. They're the third generation of chemically confused. So they're born into autoimmune disease. They're born into dehydration. They've officially adjusted the percentage of water in the body by medical and education standards to be 60 to 65% from 70%. So in other words, we're, we're accepting and training people that it's okay to be dehydrated. So it's a slippery slope. And here, this is coming from a guy who had all the technology, all the tools, who took $700 worth of supplements every day of my life since I was like, literally since I was 16 years old. And to all the way on the flip side, where my body performs best when I fast. And think about this. So taking all the way down, when I am in fasting and I'm in my third day of my fast or before there, somewhere between day and a half and the third day, my body's producing stem cells. Stem cells have the ability to convert into any cell that we have, right? So even eating takes away my body's ability to heal. So when I think about it that way, I think about what am I really, why am I eating? And since it uses 80% of my energy to digest, process, eliminate, I'm going to make sure if I am eating, it's the simplest, the best, the highest nutrition, the most enjoyment factor as well at the same time. This is why I love what you do. It's make it simple, make it enjoyable, make it, make every bite a perfect bite. That's what, that's part of this whole idea of simplicity. It, and it starts at the inside of us and it reflects in the world around us. So beautifully said. I, I love how you keep saying the body is always wanting to heal itself. That's, that's its default setting. Yeah, and and I and I want to get into emotional pain and <clears throat> our, how do we store these emotional pains or stress in our body as well, and why is that so? 
such a beautiful thing to discover that our, as you were saying before, you know, our joints might be in pain or different parts of our body might be suffering pain, but the emotional connection to that uh, injury or discomfort and the emotional link to it. I think you have to start off and ask what disease is. Because disease is the body's not at ease. So if I'm fearful or anxious in my body, am I at ease? No. I am in disease. If I stay in that state, emotional state, long enough, eventually it will create enough issues in my body. Like if I'm in if I'm in pain or in anxiety, or if I'm sad, if I'm fearful, my body can't digest, rest, and process. It's, it's not my opinion. That is a scientific fact. And if I continue to put food and things and do things in my body, it can't repair at night. It can't, it can't uh, absorb the nutrients from the food. It can't get the repair. It can't get the medicine. If I'm fearful in my body. <clears throat> so that means that over time, my body is breaking down. So disease, all disease is emotional. And I know that you're going to have a lot of people that are just going to say, what is that? What about a baby that's born with a... So let's talk about that. Let's say, and I deal with this literally today, every day. Baby born with brain cancer, three years old. Just had a baby that was three years old, two brain surgeries. The parents said on the third one, they said, <clears throat> nope, we're not doing it more. They've been since July doing the mineralization, the process. The baby is now completely in remission. They've done it themselves. They All they've done is mineralize the body, taken the stress out, take the inflammation out and move the tissue. And, and the tumor is down by 75% and, the and there's no, and it's not mastitized. So, by all means, that is success. And the baby, but how could this sweet, innocent baby have disease when it comes out? That's emotional. Well, when the baby's being born, and in the growth part, the first three trimesters, the first two trimesters into the third one, all the way to the eighth month, there is no neocortex formed in the, in the, uh, at the child at that time. The neocortex is allows us that perception, allows us to separate ourselves, so stand separate from those around us. So the baby has all of the emotional complex of the mother, right down to and it feels the vibration. So if a car backfires and the mother goes, oh my God, I'm being shot at. Now she goes, oh, it was only a car. So the narrative calmed her down from the emotional pain. Fair statement, reaction, emotional, then, then the narrative is I'm being shot at. I look over there, well, maybe I'm not being shot at. So the, ch the challenge is, is that, is that the way we perceive sound and, and an example, for example, and we perceive things is frequency or vibration. So if that, that child later on in life, the car backfires, it has the memory response of the mother, but doesn't have the narrative to satiate that experience. So the child who comes into this world with a disease is carrying something that the mother was carrying emotion. Now, I don't want moms and dads to go that you can't blame me for that. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not blaming you. I'm giving you a piece of information, which allows you to alter the course of your child's the dis-ease process. Children are naturally have the, uh, and we did this over in our clinic with over 10,000 patients with thousands of children where we have the patient and we would lab test the children for free. So what we found is that the mother's subclinical lab, like how hard is the liver working? How hard, not blood work, but sub, like how hard is the liver functioning? How hard is the kidneys working? How hard is the bladder working? Looking at those functions, we found that, that the children under the age of 13 had the same pairing function issues with their organs as the mother. That makes sense. I mean, if I'm angry, you feel it. 
You can feel me being angry. If you're a child, you're going to feel the mother being angry. Anger affects the liver. Makes perfect sense, right? <clears throat> so now the child, um, we repair the mother. So the mother goes through a series of treatments and care. And then we go back and test, test the children again with no intervention. And their organs are now running better. So it's time to take responsibility. There isn't any accidents in this world. All this, and in order for a genetic disease, even a genetic disease to, to come out, it has to have epigenetics or it has to have environmental stressors. What's the greatest environmental stressor? An emotion. An emotion fires a hormone like stress that has more impact on you than any toxin that's out there. It's the greatest stressor of the human body. It's the greatest ager. And you can see that when somebody goes through like, like four or five years of a stressful event, they age like 20, 30 years. So stress is what, is what impacts. Emotions are the greatest stressor to the human body. And if the parents and if the kids, uh, if the parents are angry and frustrated and sad and fearful and guilty and shameful, the, parent, the kids are going to feel that too. That's genetics. Because genetics doesn't mean if you and I, if you're my dad and you have the same, I have the same gene, doesn't mean I get it. I have to have the environmental stressors. Well, that stressor is I sit down and I eat with you every day. And this is why, again, what you do is so important. Eating with joy. Because when you eat food, you hit the save button on the emotion. Because it fires hormone, which saves the emotion. That's what they do on your phone. They fire hormones to save the emotion, to program it. Or on TV, they clap. You know, even a fake clap, it creates oxytocin. You can feel it. Hey. <laughs> fake clap, fake laugh. It creates oxytocin. So it saves on this computer. So the parents have the opportunity to make a change by changing their behavior and taking care of themselves. And when the parents take care of themselves, the children begin to heal. Eating food, by the way, sorry, I meant to say this. Yeah. That's why making your food look great, enjoying the food. If you eat it like fuel, like I got to get it in, because it's not fuel, it's taking your energy. That's not my opinion, scientific fact. 80% of your energy is in the digestion, processing, eliminating. That means it's not giving you energy, it's taking away your energy. So it's, let's say it's a medication. That's why if we, I enjoy it, if it looks beautiful, if it tastes good, if it's prepared with loving and caring, like I'm proud of it, then I'm going to actually have a better response with it. Mm. I love that. You're on a mission and your team is on a mission. Yeah. Tell us about it. What, 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 it, what is your intention for humanity with the information that you have? You know, I, <clears throat> some people uh, make a deal with the devil. <laughs> I made one with God. Um, <clears throat> for those of you guys who do know my story, I have an interesting one. I, I used to keep secrets for the governments and people. And so when I wouldn't turn over my secret machine, my encryption devices, my codes, servers, uh, I was arrested and I spent 27 months, 17 months in solitary confinement. I was in the greatest pain in my life while I was in solitary confinement. And I made a promise that if, if I said, God, if you help me out of this, you help me out of this pain and you help me out of this, I'll spend the rest of my life helping people. So that was my commitment. Four hours later, click, my door opens and uh, I was in California, federal prisons. And they're overcrowded. They took a neurologist who was a chiropractor and he was in my cell with me for 14 months. Come on. That was my pain and learning all that at that time. So when I got out, I started a clinic. And I started building around other people who had been successful because I wasn't a practitioner. I learned, but I wasn't one. I was still learning, still doing my, my dissertation. But when I started discovering that the real answer wasn't to go to anybody else, it was to do it myself, I knew at that time that this was so simple and so easy and innately in all of us. It had to be free for every person. It needs, it's a part of us. You can't 
take something that's innate. It'd be like patenting your nose. You can't patent a nose or an eyeball or a tooth. So this is innate to us. It's how our body communicates. It's a language. Fascial maneuvers is a, is, a, is a philosophy of movement that uses the language of a body to help your nervous system connect your thoughts, feelings, and emotions to movement. And I just knew that had to be free. So I got out of pain after a lifetime. And I, it's literally every day I get up and I help people. Not the way I used to. I don't fix anybody anymore because that doesn't work. I help them believe in themselves and their body's ability to heal. And we found ways, because we, we had to make it free, so we found ways to fund ourselves. You know, one of them was supplements. Uh, another one is we do some classes and stuff like that, which everything is free. There's workshops, there's courses. You can go all the way up to a practitioner level, not even meet me. And, but we, but our community loves it and helps so much. That's why there's 20 million people around the world doing this with three and a half million people online. It's because, uh, because we give it out and we help. And I believe that caring that was taken out of community it's time to come back into community. And in order for that to happen is we have to teach people to not fear themselves again, their bodies, that their home, because this is my home. It doesn't matter about this. And if I don't fear this, then I don't, I don't fear helping somebody else. I don't, it takes away selfishness and all the other things. But if I'm still in pain, there's just no way I could, I could do this. It's my own journey. And, I'm on a mission because it's time to change. I, I had some tears coming up then, and I think you did too. And um, I want to ask you a, a, a personal question, and it's something that I've I've often thought about. I mean, I've just turned fifty in the last. Um, last year and my question to you is how old are you and not that it, it, it really matters to me in any way shape or form but the reason that I'm asking you this is there's a deep belief and fear that as we hit 30 40 50 it's a downhill journey and I don't subscribe to that in any way shape or form I believe that we have the ability to evolve and grow and become wiser and stronger and and work through our shit so to speak to to get to this beautiful well it's a choice to be in uh, bliss and peace and contentment and joy and I want to understand your philosophy on where you are now and where you see yourself in the future and and in particular your philosophy around aging and if you actually use that word aging or do you have a, a different word about the the journey of the human being we're either growing or we're dying <clears throat> there isn't a plateau in between and if you get up in the morning feet and you can't move you feel old like an old man you get up in the morning and you've got lots of energy and you get out of bed and you spring you feel like a young man what I feel and emotionally, I emotionally move towards. In my clinic, I had 70, 80, 90 year old men that moved like 20, 30 year old men. And I had 20, 30 year old men that moved like 70, 80, 90 year old men. And I could find no direct correlation to age and function in the body. Um, <clears throat> so we don't, age we get worn out but if the body is a self-healing machine then that means the what gets worn out is at the cellular level that means if i remove food and i fast like you're teaching fasting retreats right now which which we talk about is hilarious i love that then that body can heal and get young again and anybody who's watched my journey i show up every day on live because i'm not only because I want to help people, I'm taking away 
any, any way of arguing with the journey. I have completely changed my life. I have better health than I have at any point in my life. I'm more limber, more flexible, more whole. I'm all, I'm looking younger even since the time I've been going through a shift just this last month that I can't even begin to explain. And aging is not, has nothing to do, zero to do with time. It has to do with my belief. And as I believe and change, I'm living proof and not just me now. I have tens of thousands of people around the world that sharing their photographs, their befores and afters, and they're all getting, even Jason, my partner, he's only 30 years old and he looks like he lost 10 years. So it's really about the condition of this. We live in a fluid adaptive biological computing system. And just like a car that was made in 1920, if you put in all the original parts and you repair it and you keep repairing it, it drives just as well 100 years later. Our body, the parts are the cells. And our cells rejuvenate every seven years. And if we give our body the ability to, and we put the right parts back in, if we, let, if we give it the tools and the environment to do such, we don't age. And furthermore, if you go back to my great grandparents, they were like hauling bales of hay and chasing chickens around until the day they decide to leave. They didn't get old. They didn't, they didn't look old. They had they didn't look all wrinkly like like 80-year-olds today look old. They look like they're dying. They didn't look like that. We have been sold a bill of goods. That, that is a condition to our belief system. And our belief overrides every aspect of the human experience. We have been taught that we, as, we, as the years go by, we get old. We even use, well, it's, I'm getting older. You know when you get old. I am living proof that is, that's not true right now. And I have an army of people behind me. I mean an army of people behind me getting younger and sharing evidence, photographs every month, sharing stories of performance in their body, sharing reversals of, of diagnoses and, and symptoms. And we have the largest, um, the largest test group, health test group, uh, health study on the planet going right now because we turned everybody into their own scientists. They're reporting, because when we do a science experiment and we test somebody, we call them up, we give them a drug, and we, what happened? Did you feel this? Did you feel that? And we get some, some guy to ask some questions. We turn them into evidence-bearing machines. And they, you can go on our app and you can see it. We're not supposed to age. We're supposed to have 28-year-old bodies until the day that we decide to leave this planet. And somebody told us different and we believe that different. Tell me about your definition of medicine. What 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 does medicine mean to you? And should we even use that word anymore? I I think it's I think medicine is <clears throat> is an outdated word. I think it had its place. Um, you know, we say food is our medicine, but you know, to be truthful, fasting is our medicine. We produce stem cells, which we go when we when everything's not working, we go to a doctor, we get stem cells produced. We pay, you know, thirty to eighty thousand dollars to inject them to heal ourselves. Or we can just stop eating for three days. So I think the idea of medicine was to ease the body. Uh, the definition is has changed. It's to ease the body over a time so that I can gain enough space to let the body heal, do its natural function. A medicine doesn't hurt, cure you. A surgery doesn't cure you. There's no surgery or no medicine or no drug on the planet that cures you. Your body cures you. A Band-Aid does not cure you. A Band-Aid just covers it. 
and gives it a bit more help, space and time. So I think the it's the idea of what we think medicine is, the name, what we use medicine. And, and, and once something's been overused in society, it has to be taken out. I think we need to find a new term. But medicine creates space. And that's all it does. And But the best medicine, the best space we need is space away from the stressor that's causing the disease. That's going in the mountains. Where you live, you live in a, literally, you live right in nature, going in the ocean, um, taking time with somebody that you love, doing something that you enjoy. That is true medicine. All the rest of it is, is a cheap copy of those experiences. Healing happens in community because in community, I realize that I'm not alone. Pain happens in silence when I'm alone. But when I'm in community, pain automatically drops. There's so much science to show that. We, we've been looking at this whole thing the wrong way. And I used to be a man of science and a man of medicine. And today, funny enough, I'm a man of faith. I have a belief. If I get evidence to support that belief, I can then raise my belief. I get more evidence, I raise my belief. I get more evidence, I raise my belief. And then one day, when I have enough evidence, and my belief is high enough, I no longer need either of them, I just have faith. Faith, belief is the medicine, faith is a cure. Faith in oneself and faith in yeah. community. Well, faith community is my reflection. I can't see myself and a mirror doesn't show me myself, but my community does. So community is the reflection that teaches me who I really am. That's why we've been, communities have been busted up. It keeps us sick, divided. That's what the last couple of years has been about. It's like, you want to control people? Keep them divided. Uh, last question for you. For this round because <laughs> we're gonna have another chat one day i'd love yeah, to anyway. sooner, sooner than you think and by the way i think i'm coming there in the fall so oh beautiful hope optimism do you use those words do you have them in your vocabulary i don't like hope or or do you just trust i think trust is a better one optimism is is a way of looking at a situation that allows me to bridge between something I don't I, I don't see or I don't trust to trust. Optimism is a word that softens distrust. But hope is coming from a negative place. Hope is a is a victim as a victim word. I have hope that it will work out. I have hope I'll be okay. Say it. I have hope. I have hope. It doesn't feel good. I I have belief that feels good. I have faith. That feels good. But even the word hope is a very victim word. I hope, I hope you're doing okay. I hope everything is working out. I don't hope anything for anybody. I trust that it's working out for you. I trust that your journey is exactly the way it's, that it is. Yeah, I, I, language is really important, Pete. Um, we, language will either limit us or liberate us. And we've been taught, we use language as a form of limiting us. We, we, say, we say words all the time that we're not even aware of. Like we use terms like weekday. It means that the, at that day, any day of the week, I am weak. Weekend, because I gave up all of my, 
all of my energy and I'm weak throughout the week, at the end of it, I'm still weak because I gave it up throughout the week. We use words every day, religion, to religion that we are not aware of. Language is the number one way to control a society. And we take language and we put it into culture. And culture then grows and, and populates just like a bacteria, just like a culture and a cheese or, or a yogurt. And it grows. And we make words that shouldn't be used like fat. That's sick. And they have meaning. Words are energy. They carry vibration. And vibration creates an opposite or equal reaction. I think it's really important that we start to become aware of the words that we use and understand, understand, not, uh, not stand under them, but understand what those words are doing to us and how when we put a, a rope around an elephant's foot and we tie it to a stake when they're a kid, when it's three tons, it still thinks it's tied there. That's what words do to us. Words are powerful. Our, if I say something and you believe me, your reticular activating load in your brain lights up 50%. But if you say it, it lights up 100%. And the job of that load and your brain then is to prove what you said to be true. Even if you don't know what it is. And I heard um, Michael Jackson talking and interviewed him. And he was talking about the danger of, of words in a song. And he says, words are mantras, songs are mantras. And people all walk around saying things all the time. I'm so sad, I'm so hurt, got this broken down, got that broken down. Say my name, say my name. Constantly that have that trigger our brain, our nervous system, our consciousness into something that we don't want. The reason why we call it programming in television because that's what it does. Yeah, I don't think those two words, I mean, I, I don't think hope should ever be used. And, 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 and by the way, I'm not absolute. So if I use those words, like good morning, what am I mourning about? Grand rising, if I use the words, because I do it all the time, I say grand rising, grand rising, and they say good morning. And I'm like, oh my gosh, cut out my tongue. I catch myself saying it too. Good morning. I'm like, eh, that's not the right terminology I should be using. But um, what do we do? Yeah, we we no. we become we become more aware. I gotta and... say something. About that. Yeah, I I love the fact that I mean, I I consider myself to be a lot like you, um, because I I watch you from the outside, and here you are, world renowned chef, and at your at your center that you have. You're having fasting retreats. <laughs> right. I think that is just the most awesome thing because what it is, is you're teaching truth. And we're in a world in which things have become very confusing because people don't know how to assess what is true, what is right. And the only way they can do that is to have contrast. And you're providing constant contrast for people. Like I said, I, it was funny because I said I was said I was talking to you and it's like, yeah, he's a chef, but he's having a fasting retreat. And I said, yeah, there's nothing better than a fasting retreat. Yeah, I, I love I like I, I like that uh, polarity or duality or um, contrast is probably a, a nicer word to use in that um, in that context. I do have one more question for you. Yeah, sure you did bring up the last few years and we don't need to go into the last few years but in the work that you do and i i shouldn't even use the word work because it's probably not work for you um this seems to be a uh, an issue that a lot of people have which creates stress in themselves is when one member of the family or many members of the family 
have discovered information like yours that you're sharing and they've put it into practice mm -hmm. and they are in that beautiful state of letting the body do what it's meant to be doing and feeling great creating their dreams and then they've got either very close friends or family that are going down a very different path uh, not conscious about the food that they're eating or what they're watching or what they're reading or what they're saying. And that seems to create a lot of stress for individuals because they want to be able to help or fix, as you said before, I know you said you don't fix people, but help or guide the people that they, that they love the most. What, what would you say to these individuals that... <clears throat> that uh, have, especially over the last few years, that was a great um, catalyst for that. What, what, what would you say to these people that um, feel stress because they see their loved ones pursuing a path that may shorten their life, uh, vitality or life years? The one who shortens their life is the one who has all the stress. So if the people that have gone a certain way don't have the stress, but the people who think that they're helping them have all the stress about trying to help them. They're the ones that are actually causing the, the disease in their body. So first of all, everybody picks a path. Judgment is the number one cause of disease in the human body. So judging somebody to be wrong for their path. And can, I'm talking from a, a recovering judgment specialist. Okay. So so I, I, I've, I've had more judgment than I've had more judgment than, uh, than a city judge in a, in a broken town, a broken down neighborhood. I, I have been, I have been judgmental about everybody, but primarily myself. And you, people have their own journey and this is what I've learned. This is why I no longer see people. If you're seeking to have me fix you, it's because you haven't figured it out yet. Even if I take away your pain right now, like I can't, I could take a 20, 20 some odd degree scoliosis and reverse it in an hour with a little bit of help. But if you haven't dealt with why that was there in the first place, when the next version of whatever that is comes back, it's going to come back twice as hard as the first one. So, Removing somebody's pain, getting them to do something against their will will never work. The, the age of Pisces that we're coming out of was very judgmental and it's telling everybody what's right and wrong. And it used to be a black and a white, but now there's a gray. There's a place between right and wrong. It's consensual. And if you really want to help somebody, help yourself and inspire them to change. Because even if you tell them to change, even if you told them all these years, you're, yeah, this is wrong, they're doing this, they're hurting you, this, this, and that. At the end, even if they listen to you, they're going to have resentment because they were wrong. So inspire them to change. It helps them make that change faster. If they're going to make a change, it's because they see it in you. They're not going to make a change because you point out what's wrong in them. And this is, the, this is the single most divisive thing that we could do in society. And it's not even about what medical treatments that we did to ourselves. In our, in our experience, any symptoms that people have from those experiences are going away at their own hand. Your body will heal itself. You just got to give it back the tools. It doesn't matter what they did. There's nothing that you can do to the human body that will hurt it when it's do when it's Treat it the way it's supposed to be. When it's in the condition, when it has the tools, it will heal anything. So go off and take care of yourself. Be the example. Be the one that they follow. Be the one that they can point to because the world needs somebody to point to to say, look at over there. Be that person. You will never, ever, ever win by, getting, by telling somebody that they were wrong. I love you, brother. Thank you so much for sharing 
your wisdom and your passion and your love. And uh, I look forward to uh, connecting again down the track. Yeah, I look forward to this. It's going to be fun. We're going to do some cool stuff together. I look forward to it, mate. Love you, mate. Have a, uh, have a, have a wonderful day. And, uh, hey.